a reading from the second book of Samuel. An informant came to David with the report, the children of Israel have transferred their loyalty to Absalom. At this, David said to all his servants who were with him in Jerusalem, up, let us take flight, or none of us will escape from Absalom. Leave quickly, lest he hurry and overtake us. Then visit disaster upon us and put the city to the sword. As David went up the Mount of Olives, he wept without ceasing. His head was covered, and he was walking barefoot. All those who were with him also had their heads covered and were weeping as they went. As David was approaching Baharim, a man named Shimei, the son of Gura, of the same clan as Saul's family, was coming out of the place, cursing as he came. He threw stones at David and at all the king's officers, even though all the soldiers, including the royal guard, were on David's right and on his left. Shimei was saying as he cursed, Away, away, you murderous and wicked man. The Lord has requited you for all the bloodshed in the family of Saul, in whose steed you became king. And the Lord has given over the kingdom to your son, Absalom. And now you suffer ruin because you are a murderer. Abishai, son of Zeruiah, said to the king, why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, please, and lop off his head. But the king replied, What business is it of mine or of yours, sons of Zerariah, that he curses? Suppose the Lord has told him to curse David. Who then will dare to say, Why are you doing this? Then the king said to Abishai and to all his servants, If my own son, who came forth from my loins, is seeking my life, how much more might this Benjaminite do so? Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. Perhaps the Lord will look upon my affliction and make it up to me with benefits for the curses he is uttering this day. David and his men continued on the road, while Shimei kept abreast of them on the hillside, all the while cursing and throwing stones and dirt as he went. <laughs> Lord, rise up and save me. O oh Lord, how many are my adversaries. Many rise up against me. Many are saying of me, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O oh Lord, are my shield. My glory, you lift up my head. When I call out to the Lord, he answers me from his holy mountain. When I lie down and sleep, I wake again, for the Lord sustains me. I fear not the myriads of people arrayed against me on every side.
Dominus Fabiscum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Marcum. Jesus and his disciples came to the other side of the sea to the territory of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, at once a man from the tombs who had an unclean spirit met him. The man had been dwelling among the tombs, and no one could restrain him any longer, even with a chain. In fact, he had frequently been bound with shackles and chains, but the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles smashed and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the hillsides, he was always crying out and bruising himself with stones. Catching sight of Jesus from a distance, he ran up and prostrated himself before him, crying out in a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. He had been saying to him, Unclean spirit, come out of that man, of the man. He asked him, What is your name? He replied, Legion is my name. There are many of us. And he pleaded earnestly with him not to drive them away from that territory. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there on the hillside, and they pleaded with him, Send us into the swine, let us enter them. And he let them, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine. A herd of about 2,000 rushed down a steep bank into the sea where they were drowned. The swine herds ran away and reported the incident in the town and throughout the countryside, and people came out to see what had happened. As they approached Jesus, they caught sight of the man who had been possessed by legion, sitting there clothed and in his right mind, and they were seized with fear. Those who witnessed the incident explained to them what had happened to the possessed man and to the swine. Then they began to beg him to leave their district. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed pleaded to remain with him. But Jesus would not permit him, but told him instead, go home to your family and announce to them all that the Lord in his pity has done for you. Then the man went off and began to proclaim in the Decapolis what Jesus had done for him, and all were amazed. Verbum Domini. In the January 2012 issue of Inside the Vatican magazine, they have their top 10 people for 2011. And one of the top 10 in their list is a man by the name of Marino Restrepo. And Marino Restrepo, in his own testimony, talked about how the Lord freed him from a legion of enslavements to the devil. And his story is quite remarkable. Some of you have heard me tell, as I like to tell, the Christmas miracle of my own great-great-uncle Andy Hemmer, who was healed of blindness in the middle of the night Christmas Eve. And Marino Restrepo likewise received a, received a Christmas miracle, although when you first look at it, you would not think so. And his own story was that he grew up uh, north of Bogota in the Andes Mountains in Colombia. And it was there he grew up in a very devout Catholic home. They practiced the Catholic faith and the traditions of their Catholic faith. He knew them, he knew his prayers. He was the sixth of 10 children. But at the age of 14, he was sent to Bogota to study in high school, and he began to drift away from his faith. Later, when he graduated, he married 
uh, right before the age of 20, and then he traveled, he and his wife, to Germany, where he studied at the University of Hamburg, and they had two children. It was there that he studied art, because he was interested in becoming an actor and a musician. And after they had been there for a number of years, and they traveled to Los Angeles, and it was there he got involved in the entertainment industry. He actually signed a contract because of his band, Santa Fe, was popular. They did a number of albums. They traveled all over the world. And he continued to drift away from his faith and get involved in the New Age movement, um, psychics and crystals, and all of these things, be a belief in reincarnation and all of these energies that God was not a person, but he was like this energy that you could tap into. And he was encouraging his Catholic relatives to do the same because he's becoming very successful. This is what worked for me. And they would sign themselves and run away when he invited them to join them in this new age uh, movement and so on. But something happened then in 1996, he lost five very close relatives. His mother, his father both died, two of his brothers, one from an accident, and then also his wife died of cancer. Five people very close to him died. And he said that when, we, when a relative dies, it's a grace that's given to us to face the reality that we too will die one day. But he still continued in his sinful life, drugs and uh, promiscuity and all of these New Age movements. But his sister also took ill and she was worried for her own health. And when he traveled back to Colombia, she invited him to make a novena to the child Jesus before Christmas. And so they did so. He joined and not believing any of it, but when they went to the church, the priest said, now, if you make this novena with devotion, the baby is going to grant you some grace. So what was his petition that the baby would grant him? That he could retire early and he knew of this exotic island in Indonesia where he wanted to be like a king. <laughs> that was his petition. But the, the baby Jesus would answer it, but in a much different way. And so they finished that novena the very last day, Christmas Eve, and at midnight he's traveling to his uncle's place with his nephew, and it's there that they stop at the gate. His nephew gets out to open the gate, and six men, these Colombian rebels, come out and they kidnap him and his nephew. Christmas Eve at midnight, some miracle. Fortunately, they left his nephew go after they stole the car and drove off to some place. They just left him there, and he was returned safely to his family. But Marino, because they knew of his popularity and they believed that he must have some wealth and that they could get some large ransom from him, they took him deep into the jungle, one man with a rope tied around his waist, leading him in the front and one in the back, making sure that he couldn't escape all night long going through the jungle into the depths of the jungle. And finally they arrived at this place where there was a cave and they threw him into this cave, which was a very foul place. There were huge spiders and it was filled with bats and their excrement was his bed and all of the parasites that were there. Because he was bound and he was tied up, he couldn't escape. And he was getting bit by these parasites all night long for 16 days. That was his bed. That was where he was. Not daring to say anything, not knowing what his future was, expecting to die. But it was at the end of those 16 days when he was brought out and the hood was taken off and he was brought to the commandant, commandant of the Colombian rebels who said to him, well, he showed him the addresses of the rest of his family members and said, we want this large ransom and if you don't give it to us, we'll kill your family members as well. And then he said that 
cave was such a foul place that he would have run even if they would have shot him because he didn't want to go back there, even if it meant getting shot and killed. But because of his being bound, he didn't have the strength to run away. So he's put back into this foul cave. And he overhears them saying, well, he's seen our face. The rebel's saying, he's seen our face, so we have to kill him. So here he is at the very bottom. Everything's taken away. He's in this foul place. He's being bit by parasites. He's learned that they plan his death. He's got nothing. He's at the very, very bottom, and even below the bottom, he said. And so he began to think, well, where can I find some inner strength here? So he turned to his esoteric practices, a new age thing, but there was nothing there. And so he went back to his childhood and began to think about that. He couldn't even remember the Our Father, how to pray the, the Lord's Prayer. And it was in that moment, he said, that he had an illumination of conscience, an eight-hour mystical experience with the Lord. He began to see his whole life, beginning at the age of three on a tricycle. And he's wondering, is he going crazy from all of this? But then he remembered his own mother's death and how three hours before she had died, she went into this ecstasy where she recounted her whole life. You know, this is a common experience that people have at the end of their lives, where they see their whole life before them and the significance of their choices during that life, how it affected others, for good or for bad, the choices that they made. And he began to see his whole life. And at age of 11, he saw a sin that he had committed and this terrible anguish that he had, this pain of sin, he called it. He felt it so deep in his heart and soul that he could not describe that pain. He had been in mortal sin for 33 years. And he sees a vision of the Lord. In the distance, a beautiful city on the mountain. And he experienced a joy of being alive. He said the Lord's voice and the beauty of his voice was indescribable. The immense presence of his love, his compassion, and at the same time he's feeling this intense shame over his mortal sin, how filthy he was. He realized the reality of hell. He realized where he was, perhaps dying in mortal sin. And he says what happens to a soul in that state, dying in mortal sin, is that you hate yourself, you hate the devil, you hate God, you go into the darkness forever. So centered had, self-centered had his life been, he had never loved. And because he had never loved, he was incapable of receiving God's love. He said some of the things the Lord said to him, and of course this is not infallible, but I don't see any reason to disbelieve it. And I think it can be something that encourages us in these times. He said, first of all, that the mercy of God is beyond our imagining. But some of the things the Lord said to him, he said, one of our time is one of the darkest times in humanity, the history of humanity with all the materialism, with all of the rejection of God, with all of the self-centered people don't know how to love, as he would say that the world is inhabited by undernourished souls who cannot love or receive the love of God in eternity. It's an age where we're feeding the body but we are completely neglecting the soul. So our time is one of the darkest in the history of humanity. But the Lord is shining brighter than ever. That this is an age where souls are in great danger. We're surrounded by like landmines of temptation all around us, invitations to sin and just to focus on 
creation rather than the creator. And so it is a time of great danger, but it's also a, t- a great opportunity to be saints, to be saints. St. Paul would say, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And so although we see the darkness of our age and of our time, the Lord is shining even brighter. Although there are many dangers that surround us, that we have great opportunity in this time to become great saints. That's what God wants for each and every one of us. And so we have to be ready, he said, to see the Lord today. Don't worry about tomorrow when it hasn't been given to us. Live in the present. That was something that Mother Angelica often taught, to live in the present moment. We have to focus on our eternal life. This is why Jesus came, to give us eternal life. We are citizens of that city of light. The kingdom of the Lord is not of this world. This life is but an instant in eternity. And we can spend this life worshiping creation, trying to be creators, or we can rather begin each day, I am a creature. You are the creator. He said that we will great, the end of our lives, we will grieve over the wasted graces in our lives. Just like if we were estranged from somebody in this life and that person died and we'd feel a certain sadness that we couldn't be reconciled with that person anymore, the time was over. That we'll experience something similar in the wasted graces that God has given to us and we have simply wasted them. Of confession, he said he, he didn't want the middleman in his life. But the Lord re- manifested to me that we are responsible for ourselves. We can't blame anybody else. He saw all of the sins of his life, but he also saw the light of the Lord. He saw God not as an energy or a force, but as a person. He saw the effects of his sin. So after all this experience was over eight hours, then the rebels led him further into the jungle. And he offered all of it up. You know, you think about David saying, just let Shimei do what he's doing. We can accept, you know, the hardships of our life. We can offer them in reparation for our past, for our sins. And he prayed, please, Lord, do not let me die without confession. And he asked the commandant, would you please just, when you kill me, kill me on the road so my family will find me. They'll know that they should no longer think that I'm alive. And the commandant said, no, we have to kill you in the jungle. But miraculously, one day they took him out to a road, they released him and said, don't look back. And he thought they were gonna shoot him in the back, but rather they went back in the jungle. And eventually he made his way from one village to another village and back to his home. And after he recouped, he went to confession. And here he said, these legions were given up, these legions of enslavement to demons. And he had this experience like his first Holy Communion, this wonderful consolation and grace. And it was two years later on Palm Sunday, where he had always kept a secret to himself, what had happened to him. It was just for himself, he thought. But two years later on Palm Sunday, the Lord showed him that what he had given to him was to be something that was to be shared. And think about the end of today's gospel, how the Lord said to that demoniac who was freed, go home to your family and announce to them all that the Lord in his pity has done for you. And so that's what he has done since then, since 1999, to tell his testimony. He doesn't promote it, he said, but he gets these invitations. He's been all over the world, 21 countries in so many years. Little by little, it's grown. And one of the reasons the inside the Vatican named him as one of their men of the year is that he works to Uh, obtain vessels for many of the poor parishes and priests 
around the world, especially in South America, uh, obtaining vest, sacred vessels, investments, and so on, and helping to build churches, to have places where there's food, medicine, and education, building churches and chapels, schools, and first aid centers. With the full support of his bishop, Monsignor Roberto Ospina, in Bogota. So I think this is a message that we all need to take to heart today. That this life is but an instant in eternity. How are we going to live it? Not to grieve over the wasted graces at the end of our lives, but to take advantage of them, to live in the present moment. To know that the Lord is giving us special graces in this dark time in history so that we can become saints so that we can become a light to this world and that all of us can inhabit that city of light that we are called to be citizens of. Let us now offer our needs and intentions to the Lord with trust.